think I saw Adrian, but now I don't see him. Let's give it another minute. I'm just going to quick text and see. Oh, okay. So he had to restart his computer. Let's give it one more minute and then we'll start. You know that happens to me all the time and all of a sudden you have to update everything before you can get on so uh but i think i think we can start and adrian can join in okay this is uh town of new Paltz planning board uh regular meeting february 28th First, we have, uh, I'm not sure if your copy of the agenda has sunlight solar on it, but if it, it doesn't, uh, we need to add that to the last item on the agenda. Okay. And, okay, so administrative business. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of February 14th? Jennifer, okay. Do I have a second? Jane, okay. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor? Okay. So uh, we're going to establish an escrow for an application that we don't have yet, but maybe we can get in front of it. It's going to be a fairly large application uh, for 350 North Ohioville Road. And I'm going to ask for a motion to approve a $5,000 escrow. Do I have a motion? So, thank you, Jane. I have a second. Amanda, any discussion on that? Okay, all in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Next, uh, I have a motion for an escrow for a nine Fredericks Lane and three Fredericks Lane subdivision for $1,500. Uh, do I have a mo anyone want to make that motion? Jane? Second for that motion. Jennifer, thank you. Discussion, all in favor? So Adele, are those, is half of that the re, re, re whatever you call it, the, Reimbursement, the re, no, what do you call that? <laughs> what do you need to put more in it? Yeah. Oh, uh, replenishment. Yes, replenishment. we should have 50% replenishment. Thank you. Okay. And actually, we have to do that for the other one. We're going to have to back that up with a 50% replenishment. Okay. 
think, did we vote on that? All in favor? Uh, Ashley, do I have to back up to do a 50% replenishment on the other motion? Prior motion to percent okay. replenishment. Okay, so uh, I'd like to amend the motion for 350 North Ohioville Road to include a 50% replenishment. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Very good. So um, we're going to have public comment and then we're going to have a public hearing. I just, in case you're here for the public hearing for Viking, that's not the same as public comment. Uh, public comment is for anything else that you want to talk about uh, that is on the planning board's agenda, or past agenda, or future agendas. So is there anyone here for public comment? Uh, you can use your little thingy to raise your hand. I don't see anyone here for public comment. I'm gonna close public comment and we're going to open the public hearing uh, for Viking Industries. Um, do I need a motion for that or we've kept it open so we don't need a motion to open that, no, Ashley? Do we? Open. Yeah, I believe you just kept it open no. so you wouldn't need it. Yeah, we it. kept it open. Okay, very good. So is there anyone here to speak um, from the public about Viking Industries? You can use your reaction button to raise your hand. I see people here on that um, that came or, or you're just here to listen. Okay. So if there's no one here, yeah, yeah, Amanda. So did we just, sorry, thanks. Did we just get forwarded to us via Andy something that was like a public comment tonight with some photos that I couldn't really. I couldn't see them either. Uh, I can clarify see... what they were because I did see them. They were the gentleman who lives across the street who took pictures at 6 a.m. of the lighting, which he uh, said that had not been changed, but of course it has not been changed, but it showed the level of the lighting from his bedroom. So um, and then online. there was a second picture um, again. So okay, well, we so can talk about that. I don't think that's the same as public comment unless the person who sent them is here. Is the person who sent them here in, no? Okay, we can talk about that during the application. Um, okay, so just so the public understands, if the board decides to close this public comment tonight, your opportunity, you see something that I don't see? What do you yes. see? I see a hand raised. Yes, oh, I, I don't see, oh, Mr. Pano. Yes, okay, thank yep. you. Okay, you can turn your, your uh, photo on, thanks, thank you, okay. First, uh, I'd like to thank the board for hearing me out. Um, last meeting, I spoke some of the points. I just want to know, is there any way I could keep my comment open? Because I want to hear what the board has to say about this Viking move. See, if I speak now, I don't know what you guys are thinking or what you're going to say. So it's hard for me to you know, say my piece here. Do you get what I'm saying? Hello? I think what you're suggesting is that we keep the public hearing open. <laughs> That's what it sounds like, because... Well that's, I mean, public hearing is when you speak and then we talk, which is I think what happened last time. Well, that's that's just it. Uh, one of the points that I brought up was the light industrial. So I wanted to hear what you guys were gonna say about the light industrial. I don't just wanna repeat my words again. So I wanted to hear what you guys were gonna say. And I wondered if I could have a comment then after something is said. Cause it's hard I for me- I actually looked that up, light industrial. And mm -hmm. it did, I did look it up. If you Google it, you'll see the definition. Oh, I and it, yeah, okay, good. And yeah, it, 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 Adele, it, if I could just butt in real quick. Public comment is not for us to engage in a two-way conversation with anybody. It's for people to make comments and we go about our business. This is not a conversation. Okay, well, I, okay, I'm not All arguing right. with you. Your board, I'm just listening in. He happens, to, the, the company has to be in my backyard. Okay, I know this company is not in your guy's backyard. It's in my backyard. So I'm only 
trying to answer some of the questions. I mean, answer some of the, the things that I brought up last meeting, which are in your minutes that you guys just saved. So you know what I said. Um, the, question, the question about the light industrial, I looked up the point and to me, it looks like you're using a loophole to get this through. So that's, that's what I wanted to question about. So I wanna hear what you're gonna say about it, but now you're saying I can't talk. So I'll just listen, it, it's fine. I'll just listen and I'll be here. Thank you very much. If I could just step in there. Um, there's a point that you can't talk. You can speak in the public hearing. We cannot engage in a conversation with you. That doesn't help me because I might disagree with what you're saying and I can't speak up because my time has already passed and I'm not allowed to talk anymore. See, I, I disagree with the way you guys are looking at light industrial. To me, light industrial is not the Viking factory. So, I mean, I have points. I mean, there's eight tractor trailer tra trailers sitting right there right now on their platform. I mean, they have loading docks and loading material and machinery. It's not light industrial, according to the definition of light industrial. Now you might be using your, what the point that you brought up to me as a loophole to let this go through. It's wrong. And that's, I, I disagree with the way you're looking at this. That's all, I'm not trying to cause any trouble. I'm just trying to bring it up. Thank you. And maybe, you know, maybe you'll hear more later. Uh, and your points, uh, everything that's in the public hearing is gonna uh, get addressed at some point during, during the review, maybe not tonight, but during the review. Because Thank you. That's Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Board. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else for public hearing? So I think we have to decide whether we want to keep this public hearing open or if we want to close the public hearing. Any thoughts? I think maybe one more 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 round since we're going to be looking at this later and discussing it and there may be more comments from the public hearing for the public hearing but if everybody disagrees you know i'm okay with with whatever the group decide you know whatever the majority decides amanda i know you yeah I look, i'm looking is, <laughs> well, we're, we're going to start looking at the EAF part two tonight, you know, and really getting into it. We still haven't done our site visit, so there may still be other things that come up that we, you know, talk about or whatever. So I, I don't know that it, I don't think it, it has any impact on our actions or the timelines to leave the public hearing open. Okay. Um... So it's just a straw poll. Who would like to keep the public hearing open? Three, four, sounds like everyone. So, okay, we're gonna keep it open. Ashley, do we need to make a motion for that? Or you could do a motion to adjourn the public hearing to your next, to the next meeting, meeting, which is March 14th. 14th thank you, at 7 p.m. Okay. Don't move. Okay. Do you have a second? No seconds? Lyle. Lyle. Oh, okay, Lyle. Okay. All in favor of adjourning the public hearing to March 14th? Aye. Aye. Okay. Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we have next a conceptual review a 15 minute conceptual review for a subdivision on Canaan Road. Uh, those is the applicant here? Uh, yes, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Okay, good evening. Um, Mike Bodendorf, Hudson Land Design, engineer for the applicant. I believe one of the applicants, uh, Daniela Guimaras is on, um, or she's getting on. Actually, I see her there. I'm right here, hello. Okay, all right, great. Um, so we're, we're appearing before you tonight to just give you a, a quick look at a proposed two lot subdivision uh, located on 116 Canaan Road. Uh, the parcel gains access from the east side of Canaan Road. There's an existing residential structure there, um, better known as the, uh, the dome house or the round house. Um, 
And the applicants are looking to subdivide uh, an additional single family residential lot from the existing lot. Um, I can share my screen just to kind of go through the layout. Okay, so the existing lot is about 28.4 acres. Um, there's no existing water, municipal water or sewer in the area. So the existing uh, dome structure, which is located here is on its own well and septic system. An existing driveway accesses the structure with a small loop at the top. And we're proposing to subdivide an additional lot um, off the south side of the parcel. And we would use the existing driveway, at least a portion of it, as a common drive um, because site constraints won't allow for another driveway to, to and it's just not worth the, um, the disturbance to do so. I don't know if that interference is from me or not. Um, well, I, I hope not. Uh, anyway, so the new lot would be a single family residence. Uh, it would be served by a well and septic system. And if you can see the existing dome house is here, the new house, uh, the applicants want to place it down here for um, privacy reasons. There's an existing stand of trees in here. Um, we've located this driveway to sort of meander through existing trees with minimal tree removal. Um, but the, the house is located in a town designated wetland buffer. Um, we have delineated a uh, a wetland here, it's not on the town maps. I'm just gonna to switch to the town map real quick. Um, this is the existing parcel here. Um, so this wetland is sort of uh, connects to this existing water course that goes off to the east. Um, so again, this wetland is, is larger than an acre on the parcel. So it does require a 100 foot town adjacent area. Um, so again, just wanted to get a feel from the planning board. Um, this house, as I, I understand it, is gonna be LEED certified. Um, the applicants are very uh, sensitive to the environment. They, they, you know, they just, for privacy reasons, um, and I'll just switch to an aerial view. You can see there's a stand of evergreens here that sort of sit in between the house and the existing roundhouse. And then this adjacent house off site, there's a it, we just catch an existing stand of evergreens here so the, the positioning of the house is is really based on that and you know we we understand that the the town does have wetland code and um you know you try to avoid wetlands at all costs and you know we're not impacting the wetland per se we are in the buffer and just wanted to get a feel for it before we made a, a full application and i can answer any questions anybody might have at this point Adele, if I could speak, I'm ready to go. I'm sorry. Um, I, I've, I've gone over your what you've submitted so far, and I, I'll give you the following points. Is a 1,200 foot driveway, not wide enough for emergency access. Uh, it's in the wetland. Uh, the wetland needs to be mapped by the wetland inspector. Uh, the subdivision, the new lot would only have 73 feet on, on, of road frontage. We require 100 feet. The uh, sketch shows a new dwelling well and driveway all within the 100 foot buffer. The proposed, uh, let's see, perk, the perk tests that were conducted were not conducted in any, any place close to where the reserve septic areas would be. Um, you would need an easement right way, right away or shared driveway agreement for a house if you were to build a house. Um, that's what I have for a starter, and those are not small items. Well, I, I just want to respond to a couple of your items there. Um, no, that's this we, isn't a place for you to respond. This is just for you to know what our thinking is. And if you want to submit an application, then we'll respond to them in, in, in a different way. Yeah, that's that's fine. It's just, you know, you mentioned the frontage. We, we have adequate frontage. It's well more than 73 feet for the new lot. Um, perk tests. We have perk tests in all of the designated septic areas. We we looked at this area up here. I don't know if you're talking about that, um, but you see these squares. These are where we're proposing septic areas. 
Um, we understand the house is located in the buffer. What I was trying to gain tonight is, is this even feasible? I just gave I... you the best guess is not. That's from my point of view. That's gotcha. all I'm going to say. Okay, fair enough. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Or do, Daniela, do you have any questions for the board? Or do you want to say anything? Um, I think somebody was about to say something. Uh, I, I, I was, Jane Chanberg. Uh, we always tell people to please keep any kinds of structures you're proposing out of the wetland buffer as just a general rule, as far away from those wetlands as you possibly can. It, it's, it's an obstacle. And um, whether you wanna do it that way is one thing, but, but it, it's, that's our best advice. I echo what Lyle said, and he's extremely expert. You would do well to listen to him, you know, as the, in a conceptual. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think I saw someone else with their hand up, but. Yeah, that's me. Um, if you look at this piece of property on either both the Ulster County mapper and on our NRI, this is a really interesting, property from an environmental standpoint, from a you know resiliency standpoint, from a biodiversity standpoint, there's a lot of really cool, important features on this property. Um, so I think that's something for y'all to keep in mind too. Also, if you look at the new projected 100 year flood mapping, you get some of that on this property. So you, you know, really need to think about where the water places are. Um, and I wonder if the owners have ever given any thought to the possibility of a conservation easement? Um, we, we would definitely consider that. That'd be great. And just, just to clarify, the, uh, the, the flood boundary is outside the east side of the, the property. It does come close to it, but it comes low yeah. to where the wetland is, then goes back up again, and then it goes back down towards uh, the Wallkill Valley. Right, I'm not talking about the floodplain. I'm talking about the projected 100 year flood mapping that shows the expectation with climate change of where you would start to see more flooding. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Thank you for um, the heads up about that, Amanda. We'll definitely take a closer look. And yeah, we're, we're willing to um, do easements or give back to the city. We don't want to just, you know, come and ask for you know, a variance or um, privacy is very important to us, which is why we're asking. But we understand we are asking for a variance and we're very happy to give back and um, in a way that's meaningful to the town as well. Thank you. Uh, Lyle, can, can I ask you to just repeat that list? Because we, uh, if we had those papers, then we would be writing this down. But your list was very concise. Uh, and I think it's helpful to know what the challenges are and maybe we can all. Uh... Okay, uh, so the length of driveway, 1200 feet and the width wouldn't allow for emergency vehicle. Um, need to get the wetland mapped. It's not mapped now, but it's, it's indicated to be there, which would. But, uh, when, you, when you say that, do you mean, because we had a wetland biologist flag it. No, our, our, our wetland inspector has to- Needs to verify it. By that. Got it. Um, the road frontage appears to be 73.69 lineal feet from the driveway to the, I guess that would be the north property boundary on, on, the, on the new lot. Um, the sketch submitted shows the new dwelling, well, and driveway all within the 100 foot buffer. And that is at 290 foot elevation, according to the contour, and the sanitary is at 300 and 310. That, you know, so it's uphill from the house, uh, which isn't insurmountable, but it's just something to take into account. The perk tests shown on the map do, do not match the areas shown for septic reserve areas. 
um, you would need some kind of easement or right away or shared driveway agreement to go with with this submission. Thank you. So those are would be uh, things to consider before you put in a full application. Uh, sure. They may uh, it may not it may not be worth it to you. And um, I will tell you that, as Jane said, uh, we're all not as knowledgeable as Lyle, but we don't like things built in the buffer. So, so that would uh, that would be present a huge challenge. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for your time this evening. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right, so next uh, we have Viking site plan review. I just, uh, just closed the EAF, excuse me, just a second. All right, so uh, I'm going to ask Andy to um, go through what he has prepared. Is there anyone on the board that has any questions before Andy starts? Okay. All right. Now, All does right. everyone have a copy of that? Um, that you know, maybe. Should get that open. That's uh, was sent out. Uh, short environmental yeah. assessment form. Adrian, I don't know if you have access to that, but Andy sent it out during the week. Yes. Okay. Before Andy starts, if the board, um, as long as you have not received any objections to your lead agency notice, you could go ahead and assume lead agency status before you start reviewing the, the FEAF. So something did come in that said that there was no objection, but something else. So they might have had a comment. The DEC. Yeah. Okay. Do you have DEC. that? Do you have that in front of you, Amanda? Uh, I'd have to get it because they not only didn't object to us being lead agency, but they pointed out a number of items that should be considered, or you know, and some of it maybe they've Andy's already done, but yeah, they had some other things. So maybe we'll look at that at right after Andy gets. Done, and we'll take a look at that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Andy. Sorry. All right. So it sounds like everybody has has it in front of them. The part two of the EAF. I'm just going to kind of go through it. So essentially, what I did was, um, you know, you answer the questions best you can, and if there's any, you know, confusion or guidance, I went to the. Um, the DEC website, the, the uh, long form EAF workbook, which is- I'm sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt um, real quickly, Andy. Does the board wanna do a motion to first assume lead agency status since you've received no objections? That way you're reviewing this as the lead agency. So move. Thank you. Second. Second. Wow. You want okay, to all in favor? Hi. Hi. All right, thank you. Sorry again, Andy. <laughs> All right, lead agency now. All right, so I'm just going to kind of go through it, and um, these were these are my suggested answers based upon what what I've read in my opinion. But feel free to stop me at any time. So the first question is impact on land. Proposed action may involve construction on or physical alteration of the land surface of the proposed site. Yes. Proposed action may involve construction on land where depth to water tables less than three feet. I think that's a no or small. Proposed action may involve construction on slopes of 15% or greater. There's not, not uh, many steep slopes in the area. So I got no or small. Proposed action may involve construction on land where bedrock is exposed or generally within five feet of existing ground surface. Their EAF says generally greater than six feet, so I have no or small. 
proposed action may involve the excavation and removal of more than a thousand tons of natural material. I think this question is more geared towards kind of a mining operation, but I did ask the applicant. I don't know if there's anybody here. Did, did anybody confirm whether there's a thousand tons being removed? Karen? Hi, Andy, it's Karen. Um, yeah, I think that we anticipated it would be less than that, but we're gonna do a cut and fill um, analysis and we'll get that information to you right away. Okay. So, okay. so if that's the case, we have to leave this one open until we have an answer. We can't leave it, we don't know. Yeah, I think it would be a clear no or small if it was less. And then, yeah, if it was more, we'd have to discuss it. And more in depth. Thanks. Proposed action may involve construction that continues for more than one year or in multiple phases. Uh, they say it's going to be about nine months, which seems right. So I have no or small. Proposed action may result in increased erosion from physical disturbance of vegetation removal, including from treatment by herbicides. I have a small impact on this due to the, um, the stormwater pollution prevention plan that they have that uh, is gonna mitigate those issues. Post action is or may be located within a coastal erosion hazard area, no. Going on to number two, the proposed action may result in the modification or destruction of or inhibit access to any unique or unusual landforms on the site, cliffs, dunes, minerals, fossils, or caves, no. Impacts on surface water, the proposed action may affect one or more wetlands or other surface water bodies, streams, rivers, ponds, or lakes, yes. Proposed action may create a new water body, no. Proposed action may result in an increase or decrease of over 10% or more than a 10 acre, well, increase or decrease of over 10% or more than a 10 acre increase or decrease in the surface, wow. No, they're not creating a water body. Proposed action may involve dredging of more than 100 cubic yards of material from wetland or water body, no. Proposed action may involve construction within or joining a freshwater, which is a DC wetland or tidal wetland or in the better banks of any other water body, no. Proposed action may create turbidity in a water body, either from upland erosion, runoff, or by disturbing bottom sediments. So this one I thought was kind of in the middle, possibly moderate if, if it's not mitigated. So basically their stormwater pollution prevention plan requires them to uh, put up silt fence, erosion controls, um, implement their stormwater plan. And if they do all that correctly, then this is a small impact. Um, so Andy, why don't we say it's moderate until we discuss the mitigations? Because I don't know, this is, I don't know, I'm having trouble with this one. Yeah, I think it's, I think it could be considered moderate and it's something that can be um, dealt with in site plan. So essentially, okay review the stormwater pollution prevention plan. We can make sure they do the right inspections. We can put in conditions to make sure that, that they don't impact the- So we, we can uh, include that in our ultimate findings on this, I think. Yeah, I think that's, if Ashley agrees, I think that's a good way to handle it. I'm not sure when you say findings, Amanda, just because that, as you know, has a specific term under seeker. Did you mean as a condition of your ultimate um, resolution here or what, or of your um, make, determination? Yeah, in our secret determination, if we, you know, 
you can say, well, if this is if that's there, it can have an impact, whether it's significant or not. We can discuss why it might or might not be if there's mitigations. And, and make the determination. I should have said determination, not findings. Sure, Sorry. sure. So if it's um, looked at as the project includes these stormwater control measures that because of them, if they're followed, there's not going to be any significant adverse impact. That's the type of analysis you would do um, in your, say it's a neg deck or um, if you're leading that way. Okay, thank you. Okay. Proposed action may include construction of one or more intakes for withdrawal of water from surface water. No. Proposed action may include construction of one or more outfalls for discharge of wastewater to surface water. No. Proposed action may cause soil erosion or otherwise create a source of stormwater discharge that may lead to siltation or other degradation of receiving water bodies. I, I put this in that same category we just discussed. I think that, you know, if, if it's dealt with during site plan, it's worded correctly, then there, then there will be a small impact. But you could put moderate here or small. So I think I have moderate checked, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Proposed action may affect the water quality of any water bodies within or downstream of the site of the proposed action. Same, same answer. Proposed action may involve the application of pesticides or herbicides in or around any water body. I give that a small, small impact. Proposed action may require the construction of new or expansion of existing wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, because the septic system is greater than a thousand gallons a day, that did trigger a moderate impact on this. But I do think that if the soil, uh, that's something that can be mitigated, I think, in site plan, as far as just having a a properly designed septic system with, with the correct soils and just making sure they get health department approval and DEC approval is required for that as well. So that's something I think can be dealt with in site plan. So I have a couple of questions on this section for you, Andy. Sure. So, um, okay, the, on J, so how did you determine, I mean, what, we haven't actually talked about any kind of a pest management or herbicides or anything so I don't know, how, how did you decide it would be a small impact? Let's see. Just looking at the uh, DC handbook here. No, oh, sorry. When we don't know, okay. you know, okay, go ahead. So a moderate, a moderate to large impact, a couple of examples were when pesticides are being applied on or near surface water body by commercial or recreational users, such as golf courses. And, pesticides, and the other one was pesticides being applied to control an invasive species or reclaim a water body. Those are the two examples for moderate to large. So I didn't think that that was in that range. Okay, I guess I guess I would just feel better if we knew more about what their IPM is. Like, do they have a lot of issues with? I don't know if the cardboard manufacturing has problems with critters or insects or whatever. But if it's a you know something that's prevalent, just because of that wetlands there. So yeah. The other thing that I I'm not sure where we should um, discuss this, but they do have a a waste stream a liquid waste stream that they recycle up, up to a point. And then I think they said they were drumming it and sending it off site. But um, I don't know what, if any, we've talked about what kinds of um, containment areas there might be for that in case of a leak or a spill or, you know, a dreadful oops of some kind of um, liquid, contaminated liquids getting out on the site. <clears throat> I 
I'm not okay. sure where to put that. Yeah, the these deal with um, discharges to streams or discharges to groundwater. It doesn't really deal with taking it off site. Um, no, I'm not. I mean, well, off site, obviously, you know, cradle to grave, you can take responsibility for it. But I'm worried more about a spill or a leak while it's on site. Karen, do you want to address that at all? I guess I would ask Rich Kochi if uh, if he knows if there's um, regulations pertinent to the uh, the process water system that he uses. Like, do you, you know? Is it? Can you tell us a little bit more about it, Rich? Can you talk through it? I'm not sure about the the regulations, but I know we do have storage containers, and they're double contained. So they're contained within a separate area so that if there were a spill, it would be contained on site and be able to be uh, mitigated and clean without it, contamination to the property or groundwater or anything of that nature. Does the, is there a sensor for the, for the double tank? Yeah, there are sensors uh, in there right now, yes. So when one fails, it, it alerts. Yeah, and then you have the secondary tank. The second one. Right. And are they are they then stored in a like a impervious area where they, you know, I don't I'm just since we haven't been there to see it, I'm guessing all kinds of things. Oh, sorry. Um well let's yeah, see. What, what we said is that um it's routed to a 250 gallon. So, okay. As part of construction, new equipment will be incorporated to recycle processed waste ink water. Waste ink water will be routed to a 250 gallon stainless steel mix tank where a reactive separating agent will be introduced. The reactive agent will encapsulate the soluble metals, heavy metals removal and other contaminants within the wastewater. Following five minutes of mixing, the valves are opened and the wastewater and the sludge will be transferred to 24 bag filter tank where the sludge will be contained and the recycled water will be transferred to dual polishing vessels and single bag filter tank. The polishing tanks are used to remove remaining soluble metals from the recycled water. The treated water will then be recycled and used to clean the rollers on the printers. Following five iterations, recycled water will be diverted to a holding tank for disposal offsite. Rich, what happens That's, with the sludge? Yeah. The sludge is disposed of with our solid waste into uh, dumpsters. Okay, so the, the the water after the five uses goes into the double walled um, vessels. That's what you were talking about? Yes. Okay. And the sludge goes into some, uh, some um, hazardous material disposal stream. I think Rich said that they put it into a dumpster. Um, it may be that that it's collected by, um, you know, licensed. Well, I'm sure it's collected by licensed carters and removed to a licensed facility that will take it. Okay. So the, you know, it all sounds great as long as nothing nothing gets a hole in it. Well, if the one gets a hole in it, the second one's still there. Right. Also the sludge too, though, whatever container it's in. So, okay. Karen, were you reading from something that you had submitted? That's correct. From the EAF. The part one or the report that you had done? The part one narrative report that accompanied it. Thank you. All right. Is that everything, Amanda? Well, I mean, yeah, I guess I guess what it, what I'm saying is there. I think these are things we should think about. Um, 
as, to, as far as what kind of impact they might have. And until, you know, so we are understanding what they're saying about how they're, how they're handling it. I think the other thing is to see how, how well that works, but yeah. At the site visit. Right. Okay. That sounds right. So, I mean, we can hold off. We're going through what we can. Right. What we can't, we can't. Okay. Moving on to groundwater. The proposed action may result in new or additional use of groundwater and may have the potential to introduce uh, contaminants to groundwater or an aquifer. Yes. Proposed action may require new water supply wells or create additional demand on supplies from existing water supply wells. I think there's some additional demand on their wells, so I had small. Water supply demand from the proposed action may exceed safe and sustainable water withdrawal capacity rate of the local supply or aquifer. I have small, I don't know of any known issues or known well issues in that area. Proposed action may allow or result in residential uses in areas without water and sewer services. No. Proposed action may include or require wastewater discharge to groundwater. And that I put as small, it does have wastewater discharge into groundwater, but it said that if there's a properly designed plan with the proper soils um, and approved by the health department, that it would it'd be considered small impact. Proposed action may result in the construction of water supply wells in locations where groundwater is or is suspected to be contaminated. No. Proposed action may require the bulk storage of petroleum or chemical products over groundwater or an aquifer. Not that I'm aware of, but I guess we maybe we'll see something at the site visit. Are there actually the one we asked in that? Is there um, are there oil petroleum tanks underground or other, Karen or Rich? Um, I don't believe I don't believe so, but I'm just going to check and see what we had on the EAF form because we had to declare whether there were greater than a thousand um, gallons, I believe. Let's see. No. Okay. A combined capacity of over 1,100 gallons. Sorry, was that your question? If it was greater than that? Well, I guess the, no, the question was, uh, are there underground tanks? Are there underground tanks at all? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd have to ask Rich that question. I'm not sure. OK. All right. So Andy, do you know if, if this property, I mean, in this area, is there an aquifer under there? Aquifer mapping is a little bit uh, yeah. subjective, but um, yeah, I can try and check quickly here on the. Um, there's a couple different sources on that. But um, Karen's saying that as long as it's not more than 1,100 gallons, it's not considered bulk storage. Is that correct? Karen? Sorry, yeah, I mean, you need a bulk storage permit, I believe, when it's greater than 1,100 gallons. Um, and we don't have that here on the site. Or for chemical products of 185 gallons in above ground storage. So yeah, that's a question on the part one EAF form. It says, will the proposed action include any bulk storage of petroleum combined capacity of over 1,100 gallons or chemical products, 185 gallons in above ground storage or any amount in underground storage. 
And our answer was no. Okay. So, so no underground and nothing more than those amounts above ground. Uh, it's That's correct. It's, it's no above those amounts above ground and nothing underground. Yes. Cool. Okay, so we're not we're not above an act for at least on the Ulster parcel here. All right. So it sounds like this one's got nose all over it. Yeah. Proposed action may involve the commercial application of pesticides within 100 feet of potable drinking water or irrigation sources. I would say no or small. Impact on flooding. Proposed action may result in development on land subject to flooding. I put no. Impacts on air. The proposed action may include a state regulated air emission source. No. Impact on plants and animals. Proposed action may result in a loss of flora or fauna. And that's pretty much a yes on every project. Okay, so the first four left blanks, we're waiting to hear from Mark Carabata. Um, and he got his report out on the um, on the bog turtle. Pose action may cause reduction in population or loss of individuals of any threatened or endangered species as listed by New York State or the federal government that use the site or found on over or near the site. So the, they concluded, the applicant, that it's not bog turtle habitat and Mark Carabata agreed. So I'd, I'd say no or small. B is a pros action may result in a reduction or degradation of any habitat used by any rare, threatened or endangered species as listed by New York state or federal government. Same answer, no or small. Proposed action may cause reduction in population or loss of individuals of any species of special concern or conservation need as listed by New York State or the federal government that use the site or found on, over, or near the site. Uh, I'd say no or small. Proposed action may result in a reduction or degradation of any habitat used by any species of special concern and conservation need as listed by New York State or the federal government. No. Proposed action may diminish the capacity of a, nat of a registered national natural land park mark to support the biological community it was established to protect. No. Proposed action may result in the removal of or ground disturbance in any portion of a designated significant natural community. There is not one on the mapper in this area, the DEC mapper. Proposed action may substantially interfere with nesting, breeding, foraging, or overwintering habitat for the predominant species that occupy or use the project site. That one I had to read a couple of times. No. Proposed action requires the conversion of more than 10 acres of forest, grassland, or any other regionally or locally important habitat. No. Proposed action, commercial, industrial, or recreational projects only involves use of herbs, herbicides or pesticides, gave that a small impact. Agricultural resources, imposed action may impact agricultural, agricultural resources, no. Impact on aesthetic resource, the land use, of the proposed action are obviously different from or in sharp contrast to current land use patterns between the proposed project and a scenic or a aesthetic resource. No. Impact on historic and archeological resources. The proposed action may occur in or adjacent to historic or archeological resource. Yes, because it came up as archeologically sensitive on the mapper. Proposed action may occur wholly or partially within or substantially continuous to any buildings, archeological site or district, which is listed on the national or state historic 
State Register of Historic Places that has been determined by the Commissioner of the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation to be eligible for listing on State Register of Historic Places? No. Wait. That's when the DEC said it did. Wait. So they, the next one is a yes because, oh, okay. uh, yeah. Proposed action may occur wholly or partially within or substantially contiguous to an area designated as sensitive for archaeological sites on the New York State Historic Preservation Office archaeological site inventory. Yes, that was a hit as sensitive, but they obtained a letter that said that this project does not have an impact on archaeological resources. So I have small or, or not. Proposed action. A letter that they received? Yes. A letter, a letter? I believe. Thank you. We should make sure that's in the record someplace. There had to be, right, Karen? Let's see if I can find it. I think it looks like it's actually attached to that EAF report. Yes. Yes. Okay. Proposed action may occur wholly or partially within or substantially contiguous to an archaeological site not included on the New York SHPO inventory. No. Okay. Impact on open space and recreation. The proposed action may result in a loss of recreational opportunities or reduction of an open space resource as designated in any adopted municipal open space plan. No. Impact on critical environmental areas, proposed action may be located within or adjacent to a critical environmental area. No, the town doesn't have any yet, at least. Oh, we do, we have one. But it's the ridge. That was approved by the yeah. town board? Oh. It was. Man. Yeah, you're behind. <laughs> yeah, we didn't really get a report from the town board on that, though. Well, it's in their minutes. It was an action. You'd think that they would just mention it to us. It would be nice. It would be. It's definitely not on the critical area mapping online yet, at least. Yeah, it hasn't probably been updated yet, but it was just done in, well, I guess somebody from the ENCB is here. They would know, I forget what date the meeting was, but it was it was done in the last few weeks. All right. Okay, so they're not, um, they're not on the ridge, they're in that area. All right, impact on transportation. The pros action may result in a change to existing transportation systems. Adele, did we get a letter from the traffic engineer? Or not yeah, yet. I thought we had, but I, I mean, I don't see it. I didn't see it. Um, we couldn't use Clinton Manning, so we went to Carlito. So yeah, yes. And so I, I didn't get anything back yet. They're, they're working on it that okay. I could see. So we leave this, leave this one open until mm -hmm. we get that letter. Yep. All right. Impact on energy. The proposed action may cause an increase in the use of any form of energy. Yes. Proposed action will require a new or an upgrade to an existing substation. No. Proposed action will require the creation or extension of an energy transmission or supply system to serve more than 50 single or two family residences or to serve a commercial or industrial use. No. The proposed action may utilize more than 2,500 megawatt hours per year. Now, Karen and Rich, did you guys find out whether that's the case?
I think we're still waiting to get that amount for you, but I'm sure it's less than that. Yeah, I would think, but I just wanted to kind of check yep. that box. All right, so we'll leave that open. Proposed action may involve the heating and or cooling of more than 100,000 square feet of building area when completed, no or small. It's actually not no, because isn't it going to be, it'll be more than 100,000 square feet, right? Well, the, the new, the action is the additional. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's all right. Okay. Okay, no, noise, odor, and light. Proposed action may result in an increase in noise, odors, or outdoor lighting. Yes. Proposed action may produce sound above noise levels established by local regulation. Um, the code, the town code on noise is, is not overly specific. It's, it's kind of general. Um, so it's, it's hard to answer this question. I put moderate just due to the um, potential for it right next to the, this neighborhood and the uh, trucks. Um, I'll leave it to the board whether they want to try to get some more information about noise on this project. And, um, but I do think it's definitely something that can be handled in during site plan review, whatever, whatever issues arise um, can be handled at that stage. Proposed action may result in blasting within 1,500 feet of any residence, hospital, school, licensed daycare center, or nursing home. No. Proposed action may result in routine orders for more than one hour per day. I have not heard of any issues with odors. No. Proposed action may result in light shining onto adjacent properties. I did put a moderate on this and I think we got those pictures today. They indicate that it looks like their lighting now is not dark sky compliant. Um, so I think that needs to be fixed. I think their new lighting plan is dark sky compliant. So I think the site visit and, and dealing with that at the site plan phase can 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 definitely deal with um, any lighting issues, making sure all the fixtures are, are pointing in the right direction and there's not not too bright. So I think that's something that should definitely be looked at during site plan and at the site visit. Proposed action may result in lighting, creating sky glow brighter than existing area conditions. Same, same answer. Human health, the proposed action may have an impact on human health from exposure to newer existing sources of contaminants. No. Consistency with community plants. The proposed action is not consistent with adopted land use plans. It's not consistent. So yes, it's not consistent. Wait, why is it not consistent? And it was almost consistent, but it, had, it needs variance. So, uh, there, yeah. Okay, gotcha. So it's a little bit inconsistent. Wait, it has it has a what kind of variance? Is it the loading dock? Yeah. So it's you'll a see. Very variance. That's yeah, an you'll area see. Variance. Right? No, am I wrong? It's a use variance or an area variance? No, it's, it's not a use variance. variance. Okay, thank you. So then, so as you go through the questions, you'll see there's one question that you have to answer. That, all right. Um, proposed action, actions, land use components may be different from or in sharp contrast to current surrounding land use patterns. No, they're small. Proposed action will cause the permanent population of the city, town, or village in which the project is located to grow by more than 5% now. Proposed action is inconsistent with local land use plans or zoning regulations. And reading through that on the workbook, if you do have an area variance, then you, that's a small, okay. I was, a small impact. Okay. 
Pros action is inconsistent with any county plans or other regional land use plans. No. Pros action may cause a change in the density of development that is not supported by existing infrastructure or is distant from existing infrastructure. No. Pros action is located in an area characterized by low density development that will require new or expanded public infrastructure. No. Pros action may induce secondary development impacts. No. Consistency with community character, the proposed project is inconsistent with the existing community character. No. All right. Cool. So I'll just mark all the sections that are still open and I'll resend that out. And that's, that's everything, Adele. Okay, good. Um, Andy, can you bring up that photo from the neighbor? Because I, it was just black when I opened it. So it was, I- It was super zoomed in. Is that what it was? Uh, yeah. I could not. I can it. unzoom it. I can make it smaller, so. Right, Let me try to forward that email to you both. Well, I had the email, but I couldn't see it. Look at that. Oh, okay. Thanks. So that was one. And then the other one, I, I didn't see much. All right, let's see. This is supposed to be oh, how it's lighting up his room, the room through the window oh, when it's okay. dark. Okay. okay. I just want to read my emails. So. All right. Okay, well, that doesn't look good, but that's going to be fixed because, right? Yeah, those those are not dark sky compliant lights. Right, but th those are three. It, Andy, if you can put it back up, it looks like there's oh. three lights. Do I see, I see three or more? I see one, two, three, four, five possibly lights. I see more than that. Six, yeah. nine. Six maybe. I mean, we were only told that there were two that were gonna be relocated as part of this project and made dark sky compliant. So maybe this is, you know, and where these are compared to where the, the um, new building's gonna be, I don't know exactly since I'm not oriented on this at all. If I may, this is my property. This is Ken. Oh. That's my photo. <laughs> um, okay. The building is going to be to the back left, but I've complained about this twice, and they supposedly fixed them twice, and it's still this way. Okay, well, that that's not part of our site plan application, is it? No, but clearly they're not doing what they said they were the first time. So, so that's that's you and the code enforcement that need to deal with that. Not the planning board. Sorry. I, I understand, but there's uh, there's ability to put stipulations on their uh, site plan approvals about that to fix those because the pro property isn't in. They can fix the whole property while well, you're under site plan review. I do this all the time and I get stuck on the other side of that coin. <laughs> you as the planning board have the right to go in and make all the lights dark sky compliant on the property. Thank you. And I think at the site visit, it's going to be pretty, it's hard to hide your lighting. So we're going to see what, what they look like when we're at the site visit and if they're compliant. So normally yeah, I think we, we discussed this at a previous meeting about dark sky compliant lighting. Yes. Normally we don't do scheduling of the site visit, but considering we, we haven't had a secretary uh, to schedule something like that. I'm wondering if, um, we could maybe just schedule that now. Andy, can you take that down, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, since most people are working, uh, I think weekends are probably better. And 
how about the weekend of 12th and 13th? I have to check in with Rich. Is that okay? Do they are they operating on the weekends? I don't know. Rich, are you operating on the weekends? Uh, we are working some Saturdays due to our demand. Um, the weekend of the 12th and 13th is fine for a cycle. Okay. Okay. So um who so we can have more than three, but if we have more than three, we really can't discuss anything about the project when we're there. Uh, we can just ask informational questions, right, Ashley? That's correct. Okay. So who who can uh, do a Saturday morning on March twelfth? Okay. Two, three, four five, six, everyone here, except, except Jane. Okay. Jane, but we can't wait that long, Jane. So if you don't mind, we're just gonna move forward um, and say, uh, what time works? 10 o'clock? Yeah. Okay, Rich, does that work? Will you be able to uh, take us around 10 o'clock on Saturday the 12th? 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's scheduled. Um, Lyle, Lyle has his hand up. Oh, I do. Okay. Okay. okay, Jane. Uh, Lyle went first, I think. Lyle. No, I was just agreeing that I could do that. Okay, Jane. I have a question. Is it possible? Um, this is for Ashley. If I can't be there, but because I'm interested, if somebody had a cell phone that they could, you know, have live during the visit, is that permitted? I don't see why it wouldn't be permitted, but then any type of video that was taken there would become, you know, part of the record and it would have to be available. Um, yeah, I don't, it might I don't think just, video could be just FaceTime. So it wouldn't be recorded. Oh, it would just be okay. live. Yeah, I, don't that. I could do that. Yeah, as long because, as it's the same, okay. the same parameters where no yeah, discussions of the actual, um, no back and forth about the project or discussion amongst the board members. Sure. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, good. And would we want would we want Andy or Mark or any Andy's of coming. Andy's coming. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh Jennifer. I won't be able to see anything about the lighting then though, right? You no. can see where the, the light fixtures are, mm -hmm. but not how bright they are. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean, we're not going to do a night visit, though, because then we're not going to see anything else. So, <laughs> okay. Feel free to drive okay. by any night. Mm -hmm. May I make a comment about the lighting? This is Karen. Yes, Karen. Okay. Um, so I think the image from the photo shows the east side facing South Ohioville Road, and those lights were not proposed as part of the site plan um, to be removed or replaced. They were purchased uh, through Central Hudson's um, Energy Star program a few years back. And we will reach out to Central Hudson and see if they have fixtures to make them into dark sky compliant fixtures. Currently they're LEDs, um, but we just need to see if they've got some down shielding that we could add to them. So we'll look into that this week. Thank you. Okay, so that's that. Um, I just wanted to, has anyone given any thought to Mr. Pano's concern about light industrial? I did Google a little bit during the EAF. Uh, anyone have something to comment on that? Well, you seem to me- share with us what you found out about the- Yeah, what it, I, I mean, what it seems, I don't know what this site is really, but it seems like almost everything <laughs> is light industrial. Um, they had a definition, yes. But even, for example, car manufacturing is light industrial. Uh, things such as coal and oil are heavy industrial. Um, let's see. 
anything sold to consumers is always light industrial, including relatively large products such as refrigerators. Um, so manufacturing is light industrial or can be. Yes. According to Law Insider, it says here, this is one definition and there are many apparently. It says it means processing and manufacturing uses provided they do not create unusual fire explosion or safety hazards, noise in excess of average intensity of street and traffic noise in the area in question. They do not emit smoke, dust, dirt, toxic, or offensive odors or gas, and there's no production of heat or glare perceptible from any adjacent site. Typical uses include automotive body, body repair, paint shops, commercial manufacturing, commercial manufacturing and research facilities. So it's, it's loose, there's, and there's numbers of them many numbers of them, many examples. Okay, does anybody want to comment on that? Well, it just seems like in terms of noise, maybe it wasn't, in, could, it could be argued that it, maybe it wasn't in compliance previously, according to this definition, but that this project is um, fixing that situation, potentially with putting the cyclone inside. I think that's part of what we need to look at is the actual processing itself, the noises it creates, but apparently the traffic or the trucks and mm -hmm. the idling of trucks and so forth is contributing somewhat as well. So it's 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 not the it's not the manufacturing itself, it's the conduct of what's going on on the site, auxiliary to that. And I did ask the traffic consultant to look into the idling. Um, so hopefully we'll get a report back that will include that. Um, okay, so just any for, other questions? Just for information, well, just yeah. for information, the, the village is looking at an idling law. So that is something that's, you know, part of the future, I guess, is trying to eliminate or diminish idling in general. Okay. Uh, let's see, Karen, do you have anything for us other than what's going on here? Um, I'd just say that based on the recommendation of um, Attorney Golden, who was at the last meeting on February 14th, we've added a note to the plan to say that there will be no idling allowed on site after 9 p.m. Um, and before uh, the before 4.30 a.m. and that idling would not be allowed for greater than 15 minutes. Uh, during um, shipping and receiving. Um, and I know that the client has also reached out, um, sorry, the, the applicant has also reached out to um, his uh, distribution contacts and has had them sign a letter um, agreeing, you know, to all sorts of things, including that absolutely no sleeping in trucks is allowed and also, um, to adhere to the idling uh, conditions. Okay, so we can make that a condition, right, Ashley? Okay. Okay, is there anything else for tonight? So Andy had a number of places that he's leaving open or you know, putting little question marks by pending input, a lot of which is coming from the applicant. And I think we all saw the um, the memo from the applicant asking you know to expedite this process so they can help us out by providing this information as soon as possible. Um, that's all. I, you know. Yes. No, I know a lot of stuff came in today. Uh, I picked it up. It's yay, that stuff. So uh, some of the variances might be there, uh, but I'm not sure. So I'm is not. that gone to Andy then for the, the, I mean. I can't, I'm sorry, say it again. Did the, did the stack like that get, get copies get made for Andy then? There's, I think Andy, did you get the new, the new Viking information? No, I never pick up a hard copy, but uh, no, I didn't get the digital yet. Okay. It'll probably go out. I went to pick up other things because I was away. So I, that was included. 
for me. Um, okay. I think that's enough for tonight on this application, unless anyone has any more questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so next we have the uh, subdivision application for Frederick Slane. Um, Jennifer is gonna uh, take over that application for tonight. Hey, Jennifer. Okay, um, so <laughs> who is here from the app for the applicant I would like to give an intro. Hi, my name is William Stade. I work for Batories and Conrad. I'm a land surveyor. Um, I'm here to represent um, Mr. Gardner and Mrs. Gilbert in a lot line revision on Frederick's Lane, which is a, a right of way, an existing right of way that comes out onto um, Shivertown Road. They would like to, uh, Mr. Gardner would like to purchase 50 feet of Mrs. Gilbert's uh, property in order to use as shielding for his house. Um, as the map we showed, his property, his house is extremely close to the property line and she's in the process of selling her house. So he would like to use that as a buffer before she sells the house. Okay. Um, and I think Andy, you had a memo on this. Do you have anything? Yeah, there, um, there wasn't a lot. It's a pretty straightforward project. The 50 foot looks like it's, it's woods. I didn't see any zoning issues. Um, they do need to submit a waiver request needs to be um, not from checklist items or checklist is more of like a tool when you're, when you're doing the application, but specific sections of the code. So if you go through that section that I referenced in the letter and just any, any sections of that, that you, that you don't have on the map, uh, do a written waiver request from those specific sections. So then we can go through it. Okay. And then just, you know, I'm sure they would have signed sign the EAF and sign the map, which I'm sure they would have done at the end, but it's just good to have that for the submittals and stamps. Um, and that was it. So you have something, Amanda? Okay, sorry about this, but so when I look at the map, and so I realize this is a, but this is involving two lots. I mean, the one that's giving up and the one that's gaining. And so I don't know what we, want to say about the one that's giving up that they still have, you know, they have structures in the, in the setback areas. They're, they're not meeting the setback requirements. So I don't, I don't know if that's anything we can say anything about at this point. And there also those, seems to those, be on the drawing. Any, hmm? Those structures were existing and, and they're on the opposite side of the property. Well, we're still just dealing with this lot and changing it. So, um, also, I see there seems to be in the drawing, there looks like there's a fence that that was all on one side, but now some of it will be in the new, you know, in the transferred area. Yeah, it's a, it's a dilapidated fence. It's, it's not, in, it's in disrepair. Um, that's going to be removed. Okay, good. That's good. Then on the, the little road coming in, Is it, is it in the lots or is it in this right of way thing? The road, it's, it kind of straddles the line, fades it on both sides of it as it comes in. I mean, yeah. it's a gravel road. It's existing, it's been that way since the lots were created. Okay. 
okay, well, I just don't know where, you know, where we are with things like tiers and opportunity since we're being asked to look at these two lots to address some of these things. So we'll get the waiver, the appropriate waiver request. Oh, look, did Lyle have something to say? Yeah. Go ahead, Lyle. I have a few things to say. Is a uh, lot line uh, revision is a subdivision under our code. Uh, subdivision requires that, oh, that you can only have a street if it's been designed and improved. And it doesn't have to be accepted by the town, but it has to meet a certain standard. This clearly does not. The um, uh, there are no private streets. I don't know how you know we're basically this would be approving a subdivision that doesn't have a street, and and those aren't allowed anymore under our code. So if it's already there and nothing happens, there's nothing we can do about it. But when you bring a subdivision application, then we, we have to do something. Okay, so what you're saying is that since we're revisiting this, we would have to bring the road up to, uh, to town standards? Well, it doesn't say town standards. It says, let me find it, uh, it's section... Uh, uh, 121 23 lots and blocks, section E lots on private street. That is, uh, 121 23. Hold on a second. Part E says lots on private street. Lots fronting on existing private streets shall be deemed acceptable only if such streets are designed and approved and the lot serviced in accordance with these regulations. No new private streets will be allowed. So I think here the question becomes, although it's treated as you know, the subdivision or lot line revisions are treated as subdivisions under your code, you're not actually creating a new lot by this subdivision, by this lot line revision. So I don't know. I, I don't see an exemption in the code for not creating a new lot that you don't have to follow the subdivision regulation. I, I'm happy if you can point that out to me. Yeah, but no, I'll have to, to look into that and see what the situation is and how that applies to, to this scenario, because it might not be something that's, you know, contemplated by the code as it's, as it's written. I'm, I'm not sure how this private road ever got in place. How did we ever create a lot that wasn't on a road, you know? It may have been a long time, a long time ago. I don't think okay. it was. I don't think it was. Well, needless to say, it, it's it's created and it's there. This house has been using it since it's been there. Um, it's the only way to the property. Well, I'm, I'm confused. What lot is not on the on on Frederick's Lane? Frederick's Lane is not a street. It's a private road, so it's it's that's not considered. It's, a, it's not considered anything. Okay. What if what if the light the lot line was drawn so that it didn't didn't touch touch the Frederick's Lane, or it just it just was stopped ten feet short of it and just went over. To my property and left theirs there's alone along the, the lane. Would that make a difference? That that's that's for the attorney to decide. I'm I'm just pointing out what's in our code. So the provision that you had brought up it deals with fronting on existing private streets. So I don't know what you were going to be proposing to make it so that one of the lots can you explain what, what you were suggesting? Yeah. Yeah, the, the lot, the 50 foot is, is goes perpendicular off of that private street. So 50 or 20 feet in from the private street, you could just have it cut back towards the, my existing lot line. So it doesn't, that the new line doesn't front on that private street at all. 
We have a visual that we could see while we're discussing it. I looked at that, but it would be helpful if, if you could produce that. We could throw that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I'm new to this, so you got to give me a second here. <laughs> So who owns that private road? That's a good question. And if those houses are, weren't some of those houses built quite a long yeah. time ago? Can we see that now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you make it larger? I can try. <laughs> There's a little plus up there in a circle. That might be, yeah. There you go. Yay. Yay. Move it up just a little bit more. Yeah, we're good now. Okay. Oops, too much. Too much. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Are we good? I think so. So who was who was suggesting what about because it looks like the, the lot in the back has frontage. No, it's trapped. Yeah. So who, who exactly. does own the lot? Who owns the road? Does anyone know? Yeah, my, my, my deed gives it right of way. Okay. So, so the owner of the road is, do you know? Is is the is this lot in the back next to yours? So I'm, Zoom I'm says guy, could could you could you guys identify yourself, please, when you're speaking? The owner is Mr. Is that Mr. Gilbert? No, Guy, uh, Guy oh, Gardner, Gardner is the owner. Guy Gardner, Mr. Gardner. Okay, yes. that's that's what I was asking. Thank you. The, the road appears to be owned by Smil Lawrence Smilowitz. Smilowitz. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh. So who's got that? Oh, that's that. That's the lot to the to the right to the east of all the. I don't know which way is north, but it's to the west. On the so left hand the side, there's the a long. Yeah. Who is the That's road part of that lot weird. that yeah lot seventeen point twenty one? So this so the road here is in this right of way, which is part of um Smilowitz. Yeah, Smilowitz lot seventeen point twenty one. All the way up, right? Um, All the way up to this point here, right here. Okay. This is the, the actual end of the, the right of way itself. But then it goes up and connects to whatever the main road is up there. It goes up to Shivertown Road. Shivertown. Okay. Shivertown. Okay. Right. So these two, these three lots, well, maybe that top one has the access from Shivertown, but these two lots, the only access they have from Shivertown is on this private road, which is on an easement or right of way from a neighboring lot. Well, lot 17.21, um, Schmidlowitz <laughs> also uses that road to get to this house. This house is also up for sale. Oy. Interesting. This has suddenly gotten more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just don't, uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not understanding this. Can you, I wish you could see my pointer, but you can't. Um, <laughs> the, the road from Shivertown is the wide strip. No, it's the actual narrow strip. It's that little narrow strip. Right the here. The wide strip yeah. is just. Is the boundary. The, the hashed lines, the dashed lines here are the boundary. The solid line inside is the actual road traveled way. Mm -hmm. How big, how wide is that road? It's tiny. Yeah, it's about 12 feet wide. Mm -hmm. 
So, Lyle, is there anything in the code? Is there anything in the code, Lyle, about access access roads versus private roads? Is that defined? Um, I, I in that section. See that I would call this. They call it a private road. It's so I would call it a private road. It's it's uh, um, owned by one person. Really outside of our 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 code. Mm. It would be more. I don't like know if park. also it would potentially be treated as some type of shared driveway versus a a road. There's there's no maintenance agreement either, to my knowledge. Among so the three parties. To... Does everyone share in the maintenance? Around for emergency vehicle. Who maintains the road? I do. Mr. Smelowitz, the owner? No, I, I do. Mr. Gardner maintains the road. Because I'm the last house and nobody else wants to spend a dime on it. So you maintain somebody else's property so that everybody can get in and out. Is that correct? That's correct. Wow. The, the, to that, that wider strip has the poles and the, and the utilities in it. And nobody maintains that either. You mean like mowing and things like that? Well, yeah, the tree branches are laying on the wires and that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. My service is underground from Shivertown, so I'm really not worried about that, but the other houses should be. Yeah. It's a bit of a pickle. So Lyle, you're saying, so does Lyle, Lyle, you're saying it was designated either in, in the narrative or somewhere it's designated as a road as opposed to a driveway? It says private road, I think, in the narrative. 121-23 well, section E, Amanda. Lots in private, lots on private streets. Right, no, I'm asking about this particular structure because the question was, is it a driveway as opposed to an actual private road? There's a sign at the corner of Shivertown that says Frederick's Lane private road. Uh, okay. I'm going and basing it on. Okay. Hmm. Does anyone know were these lots all part of a subdivision anytime in the not so distant future? Just trying to figure out what happened when they were approved and how this road was approved. We, I don't no, know you... we could find no subdivision map for these properties. Um, it's all been deeded. Uh, split up in deeds and accept and accept it out. So, and it runs back into the 50s. Ashley, in a situation like this, when one person wants to make a change, it seems to have a kind of domino effect. What is the protocol for this legally? It depends what issue you're you're speaking of as being part of the, the domino effect, because assuming things are legally constructed and legally existing, there's some type of um, right that they'll have to continue things as they are. But then once you start to change things, what does that trigger? So it depends on what I guess. Well, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, what would this, it trigger? Would it trigger the road? Would it trigger? It, it really depends. I think we need to know more about what happened when this was approved. Was this approved as an actual private road or was it a, a driveway? Um, there's the provision in state law, town law 280A, where you need to have, whenever you have a uh, building permit's gonna be issued, it has to be for a lot that has adequate frontage on a public road or a road that's improved up to public specs. So whether they at one point had to have a variance from the ZBA and perhaps that variance would spell out, maybe able to, to you know, help us out here to say, well, they were allowed to have three lots on this 280A, um, by this 280A variance rather. So there's, I think there's a lot of question marks and it's hard to say what type of impact or what other issues this might impact. I think the road is definitely a, a question. How does that fit into the code because it's it is treated as a subdivision, although the lots are existing um, and they are going to be modified now in, in some respect. 
Then I would ask Mr. Gardner, could he just put in an application for a, for a fence? Would that serve his purposes so that we, we don't get into a tangle? So, but that he could get some more privacy for himself? He's got a he's got a setback issue. So I, I don't have any intention of building anything, but but that that little shed that's right there, I, I was hoping to be able to move that like ten or fifteen feet back, so I have a little more turnaround for my cars. That was plus. I didn't want anyone else building a shed that I would have to look at. The rest of that mm -hmm. property is very wooded and secluded. That's what I like about it. Yeah. So, so that the if if it stayed off the road like that proposed line, if, if, if as it heads down towards Frederick's Lane, heads west, you see where the fork is in my driveway. If it just ended there and, and cut back towards my property, so it didn't go anywhere near Frederick's Lane, would that make a difference in the legal issues that it makes brings up by changing the footage on Frederick's Lane? So he wants to start here at this corner and then bring the line down in to his prop, you know, meet his property line where it is now. Yeah, somewhere along there. Yeah. Are you able to I'm zoom able. in more? It's it's hard to see where you're pointing. Yeah, it's hard to. Let's say, hang on. So like angle across there instead of right. making it. So if we and, I'm not, from... and just so off offhand, I'm not sure that it would necessarily make a difference because although the piece being switched to the other lot is in itself fronting on the road, the lot is still fronting on the, the road. And I think that was the operative language here that there's a lot fronting on a private road. And if you change the lot line, it, it's a lot line revision. It doesn't matter if it's if you're making it an angle or you're making it straight, anything you do is is brings it into the code, the subdivision. For, for subdivision, right? So I think the best thing we can do is make a list of what questions need to be answered uh, and try and get answers for the next meeting. That's, that makes the most sense. I can tell you that uh, the Gilbert house was built in 58 Gardner House was built in 93. And the, the frontage on Shivertown, Rommel's house was built in 1940. The so. middle one you said was built in 58? The middle one. So there was there had to be access to that, but maybe it was just a shared driveway. The time that it was built. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, no one was looking at anything back then. Yeah. Clearly. I mean, we are made out of even head zoning in 58. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Ashley, can you help out with what questions you're, you said you were going to have to find something out, but I don't remember what exactly that well, was? I think. Well, for one, I need to look into this provision that Lyle had brought up and how that might apply or not apply under these circumstances. So we'll do some some research on our end here. I think it would also be helpful if the, um, whether it's the applicant or the town could find whatever old subdivision map included this private road or this common driveway, whatever it was, however it was approved to okay. kind of find out the history, if there's any kind of record there as far as the town approving this road in some respect. And perhaps also if the applicant has the deeds or the, the right of way um, that are referenced that were filed with the Ulster County Clerk that might shed some light on the status as well. Right, I have the deeds and, and again, they're written on the map. Um, the, the, the right of way where it says terminus at the 15 foot point, which is right here, this deed is from uh, July, 1956, which gives this right away to this point here. And then this deed continued the right of way. Mm -hmm. 
I think it could best, we probably need to just compile all the questions and then try to get the answers and go over them and, and un, unsnarl this, this tangle okay. that way, rather than this trying to do it right now in pieces. Mr. to say, you said they, they extended the right of way, but it, you didn't really need it extended, right? Because the driveway comes it onto, went to the, onto the property where the first right of way was, right? Correct. So this right of way, which you can't see my pointer, um, we don't really, you don't really need that second right of way that you were talking about. Yeah, we did because the, my property line originally is where it says old lot line, which is 50 feet from that point. Right. Right here is his, his lot line currently, right here where it says old lot line. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So he would have, this was extended to get in here. But, I see. You know, I see. Gotcha. Perhaps if there's records, um, either building permits or the um, when the driveways for these two lots were, were constructed. I forget. I'm sorry. What, what year you said they were constructed? But well, the the title for it is um, 1956 for the first right of way for this piece going from Shivertown to this end here. Where, where, Do you know where, where, when the homes were actually constructed on the on these two lots on on your client's lot and the adjacent lot? I don't. I uh, I think Mr. No. Lyle just Jalil just said the the middle client. one was done in fifty eight and the gardener one was done in ninety five. Ninety three constructed, and the first one, the front one, was in nineteen forty. Okay, so perhaps then the gardener one, if there's a building permit. On, on the file and that might shed some light on the status of this private road issue. Mm -hmm. The other thing is if we could figure out from our code what 121-23E, what it means by only if such streets are designed and improved. What does that mean? Yeah, that's what we need to do some, some research there on to see what there. Because looking quickly, it doesn't look like there's any specific standards set out as to what constitutes a um i mean you do have like minor roads and collector roads you have your different width requirements and it may be that it's referring to any existing private road will have to be brought up to that you know minimum requirement is that a question for stacy for our building our code enforcement It, it could be. I could, I'll speak with Rick about it and see um, if we could speak with Stacy about it and see what we could find out as far as that, that provision or th these provisions. I think that, I think that's the best way forward. Uh, if you can speak to Rick about uh, the interpretation of what Lyle just suggested, what does only if it's improved mean? Um, and then whatever Stacy can give us about that. Can, um, can someone repeat the code again? 121-23 subsection E. Thank you. E, did you say? E, e. is an Edward. He's an Edward. Okay. Well, I guess that's... That's it for now. Thank you. I, I just want to add that uh, I guess my experience with something like this is that, you know, this doesn't meet current code. And so the question is, you know, when was it created? Were these lots created legally? And, um, and then there's some nonconformities. Are you making them worse with this application? So are, are you adding a lot to this non-conforming road? Or are you extending this non-conforming uh, right away? And that's how I looked at it as they, they weren't. They were keeping it, they were actually making it a little bit better by owning, right, we were owning more than a lot. Um, non-conforming lot conforming, at least for zoning. For right, but I do think, yeah, I mean, the, Amanda had a good point though, that the structures, we have made a policy that we're gonna make sure that the structures that are not in the setback um, 
that were built legally. So there are a couple structures shown on that plan that aren't setbacks. So you should, a lot of people build sheds without permits. So we just wanna make sure those are were legally constructed. Okay. And then is it necessary to bring in the actual owner, Mr. I don't wanna get mesh, mesh his name. It starts with an S, I don't wanna call it. It's like Silvitz. Do, does he have to be involved in this conversation at all since he actually owns that? Or is it just okay to research it because think, there are right of ways given in deeds? How does that work? I think there would only be a need to involve him if there was gonna be a need to do some change to, you know, to that area. I think while we're, we could still just try to figure out what the status is and how the code applies to this application and then determine if he needs to be involved. Mm -hmm. But did we hear that he uses this, this Frederick's Lane as well, or does he use his access from Shivertown? Uh, the, the house is used, uh, Frederick's Lane is being used for that um, property. It's, and again, it's, it's up for sale. As when we were surveying it, there was people, you know, they're already looking at it to purchase. But he doesn't maintain it. So how does that affect also the neighbors? Well, not only that, but the road isn't entirely in the right of way. Some of it is on actually Mr. Gardner's property. Some of it meanders over into Gilbert's property. It doesn't just stay in that little right of way section. It's, it's you know, road, it's in multiple people's property. Right, and the road rides on a ridge, um, a, a small ridge. So. There is no, it's not like they can easily just slide it over to fit in, in the uh, designated right of way. It is so where it is, that's how that. you can get there, basically. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. okay. <sighs> Anything else? I think Ashley should, you know, should, um, Gardner get an easement from Gilbert to access the driveway through Gilbert. I mean, you can't you can't bring in the smile of wits necessarily. You could ask them. You can't force them to do it. Anything, but those both of those are part of this application. Should we get an easement to kind of fix that that driveway going going array there? Which so the portion that's. Yeah, so part of the driveway. At the beginning. So guy Gardner has to drive through Gilbert to get to his house. I'll bring that back. Up. Portion of the actual traveled way is. It's and the Gilbert easier. house is for sale, is it not? So then there would have to be something put in. I guess yeah, if, in the deed. If there's if it's not covered by whatever easement exists already, then that would be a requirement but since it's already an existing easement and you know since mr gilbert uh, i'm sorry mr gardner has put in his house since 94 i believe they said it was built it's already the existing right away to get to that property does he really need an easement from gilbert to get there well why is it legal that it's uh, it's the only right of way we see is from Smilowitz. Smilowitz. Right, and the road starts out in Smilowitz's property. It, it just crosses hers at the end there. Right, so it's gone on to someone else's property, either legally or illegally, we don't know. It's I'm following just a asking contour. the question. I, I have no problems trying to get an, you know, an easement from her, I'm sure she won't mind i think it's it makes sense to fix that they didn't it would clean it up now. Okay. because yeah arguably there'd be an easement whether by necessity or some other basis it's if you're going through with this it would make sense to clean it up that way it's clear moving forward yeah okay it seems like it's even more complicated guys looking at the ulster county parcel viewer the driveway to uh, the next property, I'm calling it Smilowitz, 
is actually on the property of the two places we're in, in question right now. So there is no road in on this flag lot. It, it's all on the other property. And the house that's on that property, Smilowitz, is right on the property line. It's, there's no setback or anything. So, so it, it, this whole thing is a mess. Mm -hmm. But that that particular lot is not part of this application. But it, it its driveway comes off of the property of this application. Yeah. The access to it. Well, they, they should show the house on Smile on this so we can see that. But the the yeah. the Ulster parts of your lot lines are pretty awful. And they're 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 wrong. Usually, this this survey are, is the correct lines. Okay. Okay. But we do we have the list? Because <laughs> we still have another thing to move to. I think Jennifer. I think we're good. Yeah. I mean, I didn't write everything down, to, but I hope the applicant did. I think, I think everybody's got it. Okay. Ashley knows what they have to do. Uh, and I've got notes. You've got notes and uh, Mr. Stade knows what he's got to do. I, I think we're good. So uh, just one question. Will, Ashley, will you be getting back to me with, the, with what your findings? Uh, well, I'm going to speak with my partner, Rick Golden. We'll look in to figure out what we need to, to research how to answer this question and be in touch um, at some point, either with, with you or at the next meeting, We'll depending on when we get an answer. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, right. Jennifer. And thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next. We have uh, sunlight. Um, it's the applicant here. Hello, my name oh, is. Uh, How Brandon. are you? My name is Brendan. Um, here to answer any questions. Um, basically, what we're looking at here is a uh, proposal for a roughly three megawatt uh, community solar array on the landfill um, on Clearwater Road, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. Um, the parcel is about uh, 190 acres, but the, the area where the project will take place is really just on the landfill, and it's about eight acres. Um, the system would be, because it's on a capped landfill, uh, ballasted, so there wouldn't be any ground penetrating, obviously, uh, on the landfill. Uh, the racking that holds the panels, as well as the fence, will all be ballasted. Um, the only, uh, in terms of access road or any kind of um, other ground disturbance. Really, it's it's very minimal for a project like this because um, you know Clearwater Road is a long road that exists, and we really would need to add any more access. Um, and yeah, there would be some very minimal trenching uh, underground lines for the for the power. Okay, so. Uh... you give us more of a description on what the plan is? Because there's really just a lot of pictures here, but I don't see. I, I didn't see the a, a access road. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. A lot more. Here's your narrative. So, um, our engineer, I don't think had an opportunity to review what you sent, but I, I don't think it's really complete either, right? So maybe um, what we need to do is get your application complete, right? What, what would be needed to complete it? I'm sorry, say that? Oh, what would be needed to complete it? This is a conceptual, right? This isn't an application. This is conceptual, yeah. No, actually, this is an application. Yeah. Do we have it on the agenda as conceptual? I think that might have been a mistake. 
It is an uh, application. Oh, I look at it as conceptual too. And um, so, and what do they need to do, Andy? Do you know? Yeah. So, um, section one forty dash fifty two B. If you go through that, there's all kinds of requirements for topography and neighboring business owner, neighboring property owners, sorry, uh, existing utilities, uh, location map. So you need to go through that and, and, and add as appropriate if there's anything in there that, that you feel isn't pertinent to this project, then you can request a waiver. So uh, I, I, uh, I actually did that. Um, on the pre and it, I remember it's that site. So I can't say exactly where, but um, on a separate piece of paper. So I attached it to the narrative just so it's all in one document um, for for a few waivers. But I did go through, and I think I um, like just some from this uh, some of the things you just pointed out. The the last page of the site plan has the, um, a list of the pro surrounding property owners. Um, I don't know. I know you mentioned you didn't have it. Uh, there wasn't as much of a chance to review this. Uh, but if if I could have some kind of specific uh, specific pointers to uh, add to it. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to go through all of them here, but topography is one of them. Um, I mean, it was. It's missing a lot of information, but the uh, most of the site plans we see have, have a lot more detail as far as, you know, um, how these panels are going to be built and footings, if there's going to be um, where existing utilities are, where existing drainage is. Um, we can go over it. Um, stormwater is another, another issue. The DC, it's eight acres of solar panels which are a little tricky to do for stormwater, but I did some research on it and you, you know, it is a sweat. It's definitely a stormwater pollution prevention plan. So for this project, um, and it's, I, th I think it's clear in the narrative, uh, maybe I could make it more clear in the site plan, uh, but everything will be ballasted. So there's really no, that really not that much ground disturbance. Um, and it, for a project of this size, I mean, especially it's on it's on a capped landfill, uh, which is, you know, not really permeable as it is. It's got a concrete dome. Um, all the storm water runs off of it already. Um, I don't know. Would that really be a requirement for this? Yeah, like I said, there's a lot of information out there because a lot of these solar farms were were going up and. Um, it's impervious surface, but it's it's disconnected, so you can treat it in different ways as far as claiming. Um, there's a whole, it's definitely a full stormwater plant, but you can get certain credits because it's a solar farm, and it's definitely something that you need to research. It's not going to be just, you know, no report. It's the definite SWIP. I can forward you the, the DEC. Um, they issued like a memorandum on solar farms on how, how stormwater needs to be treated. So I can send that to you and you can. Okay. So, and not just, yeah, I would like, I would appreciate if you would, uh, you could forward that to me. Um, I, is there an engineer on, do you have an engineer on this project? Um, I don't know if they, we have one on the call. Um, is that what you mean? Yes. Oh, yes. yeah, I don't know if um, we don't have anyone like that on the call right now, but um, we did fill out the EAF, uh, and I think that is addressed in there. Um, I, I think I think you need to have an engineer do a real plan with all the things that Andy um, just mentioned and go through our code uh, and, and, and put in everything that's needed, because this is really not a complete application yet. Okay. No, I understand and that. And I think, I think an engineer would be helpful, right, Andy? If they yeah, I think it's actually a requirement. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so no, that's not that's true. Be a professional engineer, architect, or landscape architect. So to put sure. the plan together and certify it. 
I'm just going to jump in here too. This is Zach Troy, I'm the COO of Solar Generation um, for this project. But you know, we've just to clarify, we've done many projects all over New York and outside of New York. And so, generally speaking, our approach has always been to, you know, essentially put together a preliminary site plan to show you the concept, you know, and then just see if there's any immediate feedback. And then, obviously, the next steps are always topo, you know, these type of things you're requesting. So, not a problem. That's you know, that's something we expect. Um, as far as SWIP, I would love to, you know, just for my education, see that uh, documentation. Um, you know, for me, I've actually never been required to do a SWIP on any project unless we were clearing or disturbing more than one acre. So even say it was a grassy field or pile driving, you know, the access road is short, maybe 30, 40 feet kind of thing. You know, it's always been uh, with any municipality I've worked with in the past. Uh, um, SWIP has to be required, but, you know, happy to look at what you have and, you know, put our heads together to figure out the best uh, solution forward by all means. I think I would appreciate understanding more about how, how ballasting works for these things and sure. just how much of an access road, how much footage and width of an access road would you be needing to put in, um, where the transmission lines are going to hook in. Um, will any of that be underground conduits? Will there be any lighting needed or no, to no lighting work on needed. it? Or? Yeah. And okay. just to point out, some of that is, um, I mean, we will be adding uh, what you requested, but um, some of that is represented on the site plan, the point of interconnection um, and an underground trench. But maybe we'll add just more specific uh, where the utilities are um, existing. Uh, as was requested. Right. And uh, I think a ballasted racking uh, detail makes sense, uh, just so like how we have for the fence detail. Um, I think those sound right. And then do you have some kind of a little a little pad or there's some kind of a, a auxiliary something there? An equipment yes. pad? Is that what you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, equipment pad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's basically just if you go to, uh, it, it's, Basically, just a small pad that would support um, the transmission. Um, sorry, the transformer, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe some other, just uh, like a meter and box or some kind of like equipment. Um, but it's just a small pad. Uh, it would would not be penetrating because it's it would be located on a on a landfill. Um, but I'll, usually, it's just uh, like a concrete pad, not very big, like a table or something like that. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, this is an exciting project. You know, this is really cool. Um, yeah. but we just want to make sure we know what we're doing. You know? Oh, of course. Right. Yeah, totally, totally. Happy to have it. No, good. <laughs> Especially with the complaints about the electricity. So, so this is Oh, good. my gosh. Coming up. <laughs> <That's with laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Gentlemen, uh, Mr. Nitsa wanted to. Yeah. Uh, real quick, the other uh, part of uh, of introducing it uh, this evening was to start talking about the CEQRA process. Um, and Ashley, I don't know if Rick had spoken or, or said anything about the, you know, there's a type two um, paragraph or section that talks about uh, solar projects on top of landfills, less than 25 acres, um, that it, um, uh, you know, it, it receives a type two or a, waiver. Yes, it, it um, would qualify as a type two action. Um, right. I'll read the specific language just so the board's aware. Um, it is a solar project involving 25 acres or less on a closed landfill. So you, um, if the board wanted to go ahead, if you think there's, you know, nothing that's going to be submitted is going to impact that classification, you could go ahead tonight and make a motion to classify this as type two action under seeker and that would then conclude the uh, seeker review process. I, I would, you think we're ready? Members, I recommend we don't do that. Let's get a full application. Let's get an engineer involved and then we'll look at it. There's no reason to jump the gun here and, and, and take on something we're not ready for. Anyone else? I mean, I, I, I mean, that's that's simple enough to, to type it. So, I mean, it doesn't matter if we do it this time or next time. It's just a simple vote, as you may know. Um, 
So why don't we get the full application in and we can type it at the next, if you're ready at the next meeting, mm -hmm. uh, we can do it then. Okay. Just one other thing, often when we're looking at these things and with the fenciness stuff, we talk about landscaping. Was there any, I mean, because of the location and whatever, is there any consideration for that or? Um, I don't, do you mean like screening? Or would, could you clarify? Yeah. You mean like that, uh, yeah. mowing or something? That and yeah. I mean, given the, the location, uh, we didn't really consider screening just because it's it's okay. a landfill already. Um, yeah. Basically right next to so the- So maybe you can center. just make that point, you know, so it doesn't look like we overlooked it, just say so. And the yeah, fencing will keep- Yeah, yeah that's okay. The yeah, fencing will keep critters out. That's the fencing is to keep deer out and well, obviously to keep people out, but people, keep... yeah, <laughs> yeah, but also, yeah, large animals. Okay, we usually do, um, I mean, I think it might be required as well, uh, wildlife friendly fencing. Okay, yeah. good. Will there be a driveway around to access the so there's an existing road? Um, I don't know if you can see it on this, um, overview. Let me see. I know the perimeter road is, but are there going to be new driveways to access the panels? Like within no, we, the, we, we don't currently the have the plan there. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'd use the existing. The existing. Anything in new. I don't know, but yeah, a vehicle going up there um, repeatedly. It just makes sense. The equipment pad can be close enough to the access road that's there. And the equipment pad is, is the main thing we would have to access on a regular basis. So, does the town? Go ahead, Amanda, go ahead. Does the town currently mow that? Uh, I am guessing, yeah, uh, it's this parcel owned by the town. So would they continue to mow it or would you guys take over that responsibility? Um, I So I believe the, we, I imagine uh, sunlight would, given that um, they have a lease on it. So it would probably be bound by the parameters of the lease. Um, okay. Thank you, Ted. Yeah, Amanda. The so Acra right now is responsible for mowing the landfill cap and things like that. Um, whatever portion of the landfill, uh, you know, the landfill is close to 14, 15 acres in total size. And as Brandon was saying, it's about eight or nine acres right now for the solar areas. Whatever areas are cordoned off by the solar project would become the responsibility of the solar company. But the rest of it would okay. still remain Acro's responsibility. Uh, and then the timing of the mowing and the coordination of the mowing and the DEC requirements of the mowing would all be applicable to both parties. Okay. And hopefully they can't knock over ballasted fence with their mower. <laughs> no, that's never happened, has it? No. <laughs> and then there's a, the plan the, for dismantling when after a certain number of years that you'll be. Yeah, we can get into a full de decommissioning agreement. Typically we'll just uh, pass me to just engaging with the town attorney uh, directly on that. If that's the case here too. Okay. Yep. Okay. So um, we look forward to seeing you again. Yes, likewise. Okay. I think we're Congrats set. Tonight. Night. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, is there anything else? Motion to adjourn? Nobody wants to go? Okay. <laughs> Jennifer. We all want to go. Lyle. Okay. All in favor? Good night, everyone. Thank you. Night. Night. Night.